Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Between us, by the cross you came and broken down. You broken down. There were chains around us. By your grace we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You called me out of the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Lord, we thank you that your love awakens us, yeah. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. We're back to life. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing, we're alive. Cause you're alive. You called me out of the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found. Death can't hold us down. We shout it out. We're alive because you're alive. What a love we found. Death can't hold us down. We shout it out. We're alive because you're alive. What a love we found. Death can't hold us down. We shout it out. We're alive because you're alive. Come on, let's sing it. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Oh, yeah, Lord, yes. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you that your love awakens us and that you are the king of our hearts. So no matter how the world seems, Lord, you rule our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good.
We were talking today about not worrying and about trusting God. And, and Jenny said this thing. She said this hymn. And, and all I could think of is that his eyes on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Can I just say that? His eyes on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. So we're no longer slaves to fear. Because God's faithfulness is something that we can trust in. And know that he cares for us. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies. Till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of From my mother's womb, you had chosen me. Your love has called my name. And I've been born again into your family. Your blood runs through my veins. And I'm no longer. I am a child of God. I 
seated for just a moment, you grab your Oikos card, would you? And would you pray over them as we pray over ourselves as well? A couple of, of weeks uh, we missed last week, so we want to pray for our pre-Christians on that card, week one, or those who've, who've not yet placed their faith in Christ, and pray over those prodigals, those who've strayed away, who are not currently seeking uh, the Lord. So would you pray with me as we pray together for ourselves and for those folks as well? Father, we know why we're here. We're here to worship you. We're here to interact with one another in meaningful relationships. We're here, Lord, to prepare to serve our world. Those folks that need to know about you. Those folks that need to experience your love who maybe never have. They can through us, through the power of your Spirit working through us. So, Lord, we lift those folks that, for whatever reason, haven't yet placed their faith in you. Maybe they've not heard. 
Maybe they've not experienced your love. Or maybe they have been involved in a church but never really involved in a people of God that are seeking you. Lord, I don't know all the details of everybody's boycott list, but I know this, Lord. There are people that we know, that we love in our neighborhoods, in our families, that don't know you and aren't going to spend eternity with you and your kingdom, with us. So, Lord, help us be about your business. Tearing down those walls. We ask you, Lord, to engineer the circumstances and make us bold witnesses. Give us the opportunities and give us the words in those opportunities that would lead people closer. Maybe even cross that line of faith. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in the midst of this pandemic to open people up. Help us take advantage of every opportunity. As people consider their health and eternal issues, may we be ready to love, to share, to care, and to welcome home your children, the ones that you want us to reach. You've so strategically, supernaturally placed them in our lives. Use us today, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You know, there's a lot of chaos and uncertainty in our world right now yeah. with this COVID stuff and uh, our nation's elections and and just like Kyle said, the prodigals, the people in our life that have gone away. Mm-hmm. But we shouldn't put our hope in that. We all get scared and we all get nervous when things change. But all of our hope is in Him. Yeah. All of our hope should be in Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Because he is in, He's ultimately in control. He's Sometimes we go through life and we don't act like we believe that from our day-to-day things. I know election night I wouldn't act like that. But God is in control. He knows what He's doing. I don't know what situation you're in in your life, whether you're going through a hard thing or not. But as we sing this song, I want you to say, I want you to sing it as a prayer. And all my hope is in you. been held by the Savior. I felt fire from above. I've been down to the river. I ain't the same. A prodigal I'm not going back. I'll never be the same. That's why I see all my hope is in Jesus. Sing it out. Thank God that yesterday's gone. All my sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the blood. 
the kind of thing that just breaks a man. Break him down to his knees. God, I've been broken more than a time or two. Yes, I have. But he picked me up and he showed me what it means to be a man. That's why I say, all my hope is in Thank God that yesterday, thank God that yesterday. The blood. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. You've been washed by the blood. Amen. Lord, we thank you that we have been washed and forgiven and saved. And now, Lord God, we're one of the privileges of having your Holy Spirit minister your word through us, to us, Father God. So, Lord, we thank you for the anointing on our pastor. Lord, we pray for ourselves that we be receivers of the word. We pray for him as through the Holy Spirit he delivers the word, Lord God. And, Lord, we pray for those around us, Lord, that you send us to, that we would be faithful to the word. Thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I hope you have your Bibles with you. If uh, you don't, there's a black one in front of you in the... In that seat back in front of you, page 802 in this black Bible, we're looking at Matthew 5. You're going to hear part of the greatest sermon ever preached today, remember? We've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. It's not my greatest sermon, it's the Lord's greatest sermon. So we're looking at Matthew 5, uh, beginning with verse 43 all the way through 48. Kind of a a conclusion to a sermon a couple of weeks ago, but really a, a focus on this particular section about loving our enemies as well. When we think about uh, our enemies, maybe we can identify with the unknown poet who said, to live above with those we love, oh, that will be, that will be the glory. But to live below with those we know, now that's another story. We know that there's things and people in our lives that are difficult to deal with. We may or may not call them Enemies, but we're going to identify the enemy today as anybody that acts against us, opposes us, that drives us crazy, that we don't understand, that posts things that we can't identify with, that's on the, the opposite political spectrum, that's on the opposite religious spectrum, that we don't understand their worldview, that we uh, can't make sense of the way that they think. And it often spurs up in us some some feelings. It seems we're so divided and so um, at odds, and, and there's so much animosity in our world. But Christ calls us to a higher standard. You think about this for, with me for just a moment, and some of what we deal with is, has already been dealt with, but I want to remind you of some things. If we return evil for good in our world, that's satanic. For instance, if, you, if I go on a trip and I ask you to feed my dog, I don't have a dog anymore, but if, we're playing along here with me, will you? And, you? and you feed my dog and I come back and I, and I return uh, something to you. And I, I return that rancid, putrid uh, trash that's been in my garage I forgot to take out before I went on that trip. And, and I put that on your front porch. That would be returning evil for some good that you've done for me. That's satanic. Now, if I had my wife bake some chocolate chip cookies and I, I uh, smoked a brisket and I brought you those, that would be returning good for good, and that's what humans do. But imagine this, if I've gone on this trip and you know I'm gone and you ran through my house and you find that huge stack of cash that I just have laying around in there and you decide to help yourself to that, 
Again, we're playing, right? And so when we, uh, th- you help yourself, and when I come back, I understand that you've done that. You've, you've stolen from me, and I say, I'm going to have my wife bake those cookies. I'm going to smoke that brisket. In fact, I'm going to pay off your mortgage, and I'm going to pay off all your car loans, and I'm going to buy you groceries for the next year because I understand you're having some cash problems. And so you took my cash, so I'm going to return evil. You stole from me with good. Who does that? Only Jesus. That's divine, you see. That's what he does. When he lays down his life for those who are intending evil on him, crucifying him on that cross. He is crying out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now here's the crazy thing about this text. He calls us to live like that. To love our enemies. Who can do that? Well, I'm looking at some nice folks, but I don't think you're that nice. I know I'm not. We've got to remember that it's the power of God in us that lives through us if we're ever going to even begin to move toward what he's calling us to in this section. Would you look at it with me in Matthew 5, beginning with verse 43? Would you stand in honor of the reading of God's holy word? You have heard... The law that says, now this is the last one of these in uh, chapter 5, beginning back in verse 21. There's six of them. Jesus uh, reinterprets what the law of the scribes and the Pharisees that's been handed down that the, the crowd he's preaching to would have known. And he gets to the heart of what God really intended. And he says that you've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you'll be acting as children of your Father in heaven. For He gives His sunlight to both the evil and the good. And He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, What reward is there for that even corrupt tax collectors do that much? If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans, heathens, those who don't know God do that. But you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's radical love, isn't it? Let's ask Him for strength to do what He's calling us to do. Father, You've got to help us see some things differently. So, Lord, show us how we can do what You're calling us to do. But, Lord, show us even more why and, and what that will do for us as we Consider this passage. Lord, I ask for clarity of thought to speak your word. For Father, unless you speak through me, I have nothing to say. In the power of your strong name we pray. Amen. may be seated. I'll want to draw your attention back to Matthew 5, 20, when Jesus says, But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he explains that in these five or, five or six different antitheses. You've heard it said, but I say to you, how your righteousness, your right standing before God, 
your right relationship with God can be greater than that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, the folks who heard that said that my righteousness can be greater than the, the scribes and the Pharisees would have been blown away by the, even the thought of that because the scribes and the Pharisees were the people who were trying outwardly to do exactly what God was calling them to do, trying to live according to the law. In fact, they were trying so hard that they created this whole other system of the law that they heaped up on uh, the folks, and there were not, instead of Ten Commandments, there were 613 different commandments trying to live out those Ten Commandments, and, and it was just impossible. But the people saw the scribes and Pharisees as good, moral, um, they would be a little bit like the conservative Republican branch of our, our government. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? The people, as we look at, that's how we would identify them in our culture. But Jesus says, no, it's not just your outward appearance that matters. It's the inward heart that I'm working on. Because when you get the inward heart right, when you deal with the anger and the hatred and not just the outward murder, then the murder takes care of itself. When you deal with the inward lust, then the adultery takes care of itself. When you deal with the inward dishonesty, then keeping your word, the oaths, take care of themselves. And you don't want to retaliate. And you don't want just justice. Because here's what we want for ourselves. We want God's grace. And yet, for other people, especially those people who oppose us, our enemies, we want justice. We want them to get what they deserve, don't we? So Jesus deals with this whole mindset of how we have been lavished grace upon grace as part of the kingdom. That's what the whole Sermon on the Mount is about. How do, how do we live as kingdom citizens? And then as, as he teaches us that, he wants to remind us that there's a higher calling. You don't do it like everyone else. You don't even do it like the religious folk. You do it like I'm calling you to do it. You've heard it said, but I say to you, when Jesus says something, he's always right. And everybody else, if they contradict him, remember, they're wrong. So we want to dive into this whole subject of who is my enemy? Now, in Jesus' day, the enemies of the, of the Jewish people would have been the Romans, and they, they most certainly would have been the tax collectors, and they would have been the Gentiles, and he brings those people into this very teaching. He reminds those folks who were listening to them. They kind of, he kind of gives them a little zinger. Hey, if you're just loving people like, like everybody else that's like you, loving your neighbor, your people, then, then you're just like those despised, hated, traitor thieving tax collectors that you uh, so disdain. If you love just your neighbors, your people, you're loving like those Gentiles, those pagans that you can't stand. There's a higher calling that I want you to see. And, and he'd shows it to us um, by showing us this love for your neighbor as well as the love for your enemy. Now again, uh, your enemy would be that person that opposes you, that person that irks you, attacks you, has wronged you, bothers you. There's a whole list here in chapter 5 of possible enemies. Those who you're angry with, those who have... have uh, committed adultery against you or your spouse or broken up your family, those who um, have, have caused divorce or, or you've been divorced from, those who've broken their word. There's a whole list of folks, and yet you know you might not fit into any of those things, but you know people that you struggle with. Now, sometimes they are in your very own home. And Jesus talks about those people in Matthew. And he says uh, these words. He says, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. 
in Matthew 10, if you look over a couple of chapters, 36. Now, here, here's a verse that I'm thinking about preaching uh, during the Christmas season. Would you look at it with me for, for just a moment? Verse, or Matthew 10, about verse 36, but if you love your father and mother more than me, you, you, you're not worthy of being mine. He says, uh, let's see, everyone, your enemies, your enemies will be right in your own household. And, and verse 34, is the, here's, the, here's the Christmas verse I want you to see. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. <laughs> I always want to preach that at Christmas time, don't you think? <laughs> peace on earth, goodwill to men. And I, don't imagine Jesus says that I, I've come to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace but a sword. I've come not to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. In order for us to be difference makers in the world, we've got to learn how to deal with the folks that are, we're in relationship with already. Sometimes those are difficult people. In-laws. Sisters or brothers who are a little bit off or different or crazy, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, don't look around. Don't look at people. Then. We know there are people that bring up these emotions in us. We don't always know where those emotions come from. We don't always know what to do with those. But here's what Jesus is calling us to. To love those people. And pray for those who wrong you. Pray for those who persecute you. Have you done that? It's not an easy thing. That's not what we want to do with our enemies, is it? Hey, we want to get even. We want to retaliate. Or at the very best, if we want to do the good Christian thing, we want to dismiss them and tolerate them and avoid them. Anybody, you know, I'm just trying to remove all possibility of conflict in my life, so I'm just not going to go there. But how in the world do you love someone that you have dismissed? How do you love someone that you just tolerate? How do you love someone that you avoid? You can't do that. So what is Jesus saying in this passage? How do we deal with our enemies? Well, first of all, we've got to look at what they were saying, what the scribes and Pharisees were saying. They're saying, love your neighbors, hate your enemies. That's not really what the Bible says, by the way. Leviticus 19, 18 says, way back in the, in the law, love your neighbor as yourself. They left off the as yourself. That's the how you love your neighbor. That's the quantity and quality that you are to love your neighbor with as yourself. They just identified the person. You're just supposed to love your people. Love your neighbor. Those people that live right around you, those people who are just like you, those people who are in the same groups that you're in. You love them. And nowhere in the Scripture, and I put Pat Dean on this quest to find where it says to hate your enemy. Now, there is a section in Psalm 139 that talks about hating the enemies of God, but it doesn't talk about hating our enemies. That's not anywhere in there that I can find. If you find that, please make me aware of that. But that's not what God calls us to do, is to hate our enemies. So what uh, the scribes and the Pharisees are doing is just what we do oftentimes. Well, it just makes sense, doesn't it? If you're to love your neighbor, then you're going to hate your enemy. That's a natural corollary. Oh, but not with Jesus. He turns everything upside down, doesn't he? He transforms the human heart. And things that don't make sense with our, our heads... He calls us to. 
love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. I've got to ask myself, why? Does God call us to that? Why does Jesus ask us to do that? And I'm reminded of the, of the gospel itself. That God demonstrated His love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, separated from God, enemies of God, Christ died for us. He showed us His love with His actions. In Romans 5.10 says, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of His Son, while we were still His enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of His Son. You see that? What Jesus is calling us to is what the Father called him to. Is to restore the relationship, the friendship relationship between us and God. And he doesn't do it when we get our act together. He doesn't do it when we stop completely sinning. He does it in the midst of our sin, and he does it while we're still his enemy. That's why He calls us to do that. Now, how, how in the world do we love? It's not just an, an emotion. 1 John 3, 16 and 18 gives us a good clue. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up His life for us. Let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. You know what that primarily is? That's service. That's sacrifice. Now, think about this for just a, a moment. If I'm to love you and I'm to love those around me, if we do it to our neighbors or we do it uh, especially to our enemies, then we have to think about some, some simple prepositions. One of the things we have to think about is the preposition with. We have to be somehow, some way with them, whether that is a call or a card or a, a note or or a visit, or whatever it is, at some level, we have to make contact with them. That's what God does for us in, in Jesus coming to be with us in the very beginning. Remember? In, in the incarnation. That's what Emmanuel means. God with us. So we've got to find a way, if we're really to love, to be with. And not just to be with them, but to be for them. That's the next little preposition I want you to grab a hold of. For. What can you do for them? How can you help them work for uh, their good? And then finally, unto who God has created them to be. Because your enemy and my enemy, whoever they are in the, in the flesh, they are created in the image of God. Now, I know there's some, some people in our world that we think are, are sons of the devil. And I understand that, and maybe they'll never turn. I don't know that. But I also know that many times in the history of the world, and many times in your own life, you have seen the transformation, the radical love transformation that God has done in turning His enemy into His friend. And He can still do that as we think about His original purpose for all of us is to become more more like Jesus. So how can you do that? Simple things like greet people, like don't talk about people, like, like make contact or service or, or find a need and, and meet that need. And, and that's the way we do it with action and with truth. How can you do? Now, I'm calling this you to do this not for your Sunday school class, not for your life group, not for the rest of your church. What about your enemies? You see how radical this is? 
You see how transformational this is when someone has done you wrong? I, I love examples of this in, in our world. I, I love the one of the examples. Patton Oswalt is a is an actor, and he he's kind of a funny, witty guy was not too long ago and and not I'm again I'm not trying to get political here, but he tweeted uh something kind of sarcastic about Donald Trump. And one of Donald Trump's followers, a guy named Michael Beatty, uh, tweeted back a response, and he insulted Oswald, and there it, the battle's on. The tw- Twitter battle back and forth, back and forth. And, and so Oswald decides he's going to get some ammunition on Beatty, and so he scrolls down his timeline, if you know anything about Twitter and, and what he was involved in. And, and as he does that, he realizes that, hey, He's having a hard time. Physically, he's having a hard time. And he said this, these words. He said, oh, man, this dude attacked me on Twitter, and I joked back. But then I looked at his timeline, and he's in a lot of trouble health-wise. He's been dealt some terrible cards. Let's deal him some good ones. Click and donate just like I'm about to do. These are political enemies. And yet they rise above that. And he tweets out the GoFundMe account. And because he has a lot of followers, thousands of dollars begin to come in to to his political enemy to help him with his health crisis. Folks, if pagans can do that, can we? Can the people of God be who the people of God are called to be? And rise above whatever divides us to let the light of the Lord shine in us. Of course we can. Because we've got a power greater than just uh, human kindness. Or greater than just human compassion. We have a Lord who has modeled this for us. And so as we look at, at the... By the way, that... Have I given you any blanks whatsoever? Yeah. So the sermon starts now, okay? <laughs> Jesus, he, he's not really interested in, in just changing our minds and, and getting us to walk an aisle and helping us make decisions. Jesus wants to make disciples and wants us to make disciples. And that means we're going to follow his great example. And how to deal and love our enemies. Loving our enemies show who we belong to. That's the first blank on your bulletin outline if you're following along with us. We're sons of our Father in heaven. We recognize that we're dealing with difficult people the same way that Jesus dealt with difficult people. You realize that the people that He uh, would see in his day as opposing him, his enemies. They were the religious leaders. They were from all spectrums, the, the, the right group, the Pharisees, the very conservative group, and the very liberal group, the Sadducees, and a lot of other folks in between that would oppose Jesus and what he was all about in bringing in the kingdom of God. And he would call them things like whitewashed tombs or brood of vipers. He'd say... Basically, you you look good on the outside, but you're rotting, decaying on the inside. You're just like a snake laying in the grass waiting to bite. He dealt with enemies. If you say, I don't have any enemies, then you're really not following the example of Christ because he had enemies as he pursued the righteousness God uh, wanted him to set forth. Then people opposed him, and they will us too. But as we think about the way we deal with them, we know that we belong to our Father in heaven when we love them as He's called us to love them. They are self-righteous folks. Jesus would rather, much rather, hang out with the tax collectors and the sinners. Somebody questioned Him. In fact, it was the Pharisees. Why? Question His disciples. They often wouldn't come to Jesus Himself, but they'd question His disciples and They'd say things like, why does, your, why does your master eat with tax collectors and 
and sinners. And Jesus heard, overheard. Well, it's not the, not the healthy that need a doctor. It's the sick. And really, a little translation of that, it's not those who think they're okay, that think they're right, that are self-righteous, that think they're healthy, that need a doctor. It's the ones that know they're sick. And that's why he hung out with the tax collectors and the sinners, because they knew. They knew they needed him. He, did, he would much rather, just, just imagine what that looked like in our day. I think Jesus would much rather hang out at the bar with the folks he, that knew they were far from God than the, the folks who were coming to church every week and, and self-righteous himself. Now, that doesn't mean I don't want you to come to church every week. And that we're, we're in a process together. But if all we do is religious activity, we're missing the boat of what he's calling us to. And so we know that we belong to God. We show who we belong to. When we have this kind of radical, transformational love. The second thing I want you to see is that followers of Jesus make followers of Jesus by living and loving like Jesus. Loving others without discrimination sets us apart. You see what Jesus says in this section? You'll be acting like true children of your Father in heaven. He gives His sunlight to both the evil and the good. And He sends rain on the just and the unjust. Would you consider with me for just a moment if God only sent His sunshine on the good people of the world and God only sent His, His rain to nourish this world on the just people of the world, who would get the sunshine and rain? If God only loved the people who are lovable, the people who were righteous in and of themselves, who would God love? You see what I'm getting at? God's grace has been extended to all of us. None of us deserve the warmth of the sunshine. None of us deserve the nourishment of the rain. We don't control those things. That's God's grace. That's His common grace that everybody, whether they're believers or not, experience the common grace of God there. But you see, what He's reminding us of is is He wants us to love the same way He loves. Without discrimination. That kind of love sets us apart. People take notice of that kind of love. I, I want to remind you of a uh, news story. September 2018. You probably heard this. Uh, an off duty Dallas police officer uh, named Amber Geiger went into her apartment thinking it was her apartment. It wasn't her apartment. And she shot the occupant of that apartment thinking that he was a burglar. Remember that story, how horrible that situation was? And, and remember that she was convicted of, of murder and she's now serving that. But the thing that was so striking about that whole instance for me, and maybe you saw this as well, that her victim, uh, a guy uh, named uh, Gene is his last name, had a brother named Brant Gene, who at the sentencing in her trial, you, you, you know this story? Forgave her. Said, I love you. In fact, he asked permission from the judge to give her a hug, and the judge allowed him to do that. Now, he also said, I hope you give your life to Jesus Christ. That's what the watching world saw. A crazy, radical, unconditional sort of love for someone that should have been an enemy. They take notice when we love this way. Now, are you putting a name to it? Are you putting some ideas to it? 
How can you love without discrimination? Not just those who are going to love you back. Not just the way the tax collectors and, and the, the pagans do. But your enemies as well. Those people you don't like. Those people that God has allowed into your life. You see, he allows those enemies into our lives because we need them. That doesn't even seem to make sense, but they, they keep us honest, don't they? They reveal some weaknesses in us that we need revealed, and they give us opportunity to love like Jesus loved. Because God doesn't allow anything or anyone to come into our life that He's not intending to redeem. And He will redeem those situations if we will allow Him to redeem them. And so the the thing I want you to see is that it sets us apart as believers in Jesus Christ, as followers in Jesus Christ, when we love without discrimination. And the final thing is verse 48. Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so, finally, as we love our enemies, we're conformed to perfection. That doesn't even register on my radar that I could be in that category. Perfect. It's not a it's not necessarily a sinless perfection. It's not a, a legal perfect. It's not like you ever um, you won't ever make mistakes again. But it is a high calling. And it's the idea that God loves His enemies. And so that as your Father in heaven, be perfect as your Father in heaven, it's a perfect sort of love. That you are moving toward perfection. You see, one day, As I understand salvation, it it happens like this. We uh, choose to respond to the grace of God and our understanding of the gospel. And we are born again. That's regeneration. That's when we cross that line of faith. That's when oftentimes we're baptized to demonstrate the faith that we have. And so when we think about salvation, that's often the... That's often where we quit. But God's in this process of sanctifying us, making us more and more like Jesus. And that's part of the salvation process. And He allows all sorts of things in our world to help accomplish that, primarily the disciplines of His Word and prayer and people. But He also allows enemies into our life to help accomplish that as well. That's sanctification. And then finally, one day, we're actually going to be saved. And that's on the other side when we don't experience the flames of hell and we experience the joys of heaven, when we are made perfect. I'm looking around here and I'm thinking, you people are going to be perfect. (laughs) And I'm going to be perfect. And what Jesus is calling us to here is this greater, higher standard of love to be who you're becoming. To be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, we can't do that by ourselves, can we? Impossible. I can't be perfect. That's impossible. Here's the truth, though. Remember, God tells Mary, and remember that the Apostle Paul declares nothing is impossible with God. Jesus says that in the rich young ruler with... He can enter the kingdom of heaven. Nothing is impossible with God. That God can do in us, through us, what we cannot do in and of ourselves. That's why uh, I'll remind you of the great truth of Galatians 2, 20. I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. He can do it. He's done it. He can be perfect through me process as I allow him, as I yield to him, as I let him have the steering wheel, however image connects, whatever image connects to your mind. Christ lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me 
and gave himself for me. I live trusting, not trying. Because trying to be perfect will drive you crazy. You'll be neurotic. You can't do it. But trusting that God lives in you is working that out in you. It's a better way to live. We don't have to live this eye for an eye, tooth for tooth way anymore. We've got a higher way to live. Loving our enemy. So let's do it. Father, thank you for these people who've come to this place to hear your word, to be challenged by it. Father, I pray by your power. Folks in this place will see that perfect is to be the person who treats enemies as neighbors and loves them. Father, our world needs it. Our world needs us to be who you're calling us to be. It would be a great transformation as the people of God, as individual people of God. Love people who ruin their lives. Pray for people who they despise. Seek the good of people who at times we wish were dead. Father, would you help us seek the prosperity of this nation and this community and even the, the evil folks in this place so that transformation can take place. We can see a better way, a higher way. Father, I, I can't even wrap my mind around it sensibly. I can't even understand it logically. But Father, I believe. I believe you want to use me and this church to live out the high calling you've placed upon us. Help us put specifics to it. Names. Service projects, cards, calls, whatever it takes, Lord. In the power of your strong name we pray, amen.